thank you very much for attending this one hour presentation on crystal clear BPPV. We are going to begin uh, with a careful review of this subject, some of the anatomy and physiology, and uh, we hope to keep this to about one hour. We are, uh, I am an otolaryngologist and neurotologist in Wilmington, Delaware. Today, we're going to review the 3D anatomy from the actual membranous labyrinth to inform our conceptual model of BPPV because this topic almost always is associated with significant confusion in our specialty. We're gonna translate our knowledge of the anatomy of the membranous labyrinth to an understanding of the eye movements generated in BPPV, uh, which in turn is important for understanding uh, and interpreting the results of the diagnostic maneuvers used. Uh, once we make a diagnosis, treatments vary, and we will review pertinent treatment maneuvers uh, for all canals and even cupula lithiasis. And um, I'm also going to leave you with a very practical model virtually and another model that is always present for you to use and which will help improve your level of understanding in treating these patients. Uh, we have some resources for you. Of course, the slides are going to be available as a handout, but this presentation has over 25 videos. Those are all available on my YouTube channel, Michael Teixeira, MD. And there is a simulator uh, called the Downloadable BPP Viewer. That is also a, a free download at bppviewer.com. So let's look at the 3D anatomy of the labyrinth. Uh, the membranous labyrinth uh, is seen here from the downloadable virtual ear, a, a product of the Eaton Peabody Laboratory at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. And as you can see, there is a, a the membranous labyrinth is a very complex structure. The center of it is the utricle, uh, which has the primary otolith organ, which is parallel to the surface of the earth. Um, it, attached to it are all of the semicircular canals the ampullated ends of the anterior canal and the lateral canal are proximate to one another. And the ampullated end of the posterior canal is connected to the bottom of the utricle by the infundibulum of the posterior canal. And this is the crank case of the inner ear. This is the most dependent position. This is where otoliths uh, most often come to lie and where there is a concentration of dark cells uh, which can actively absorb them. You can see that the canals have a bent uh, toroidal shape. Uh, this is like a bent bicycle tire. All of them have this. This improves their um, sensitivity over a wider range of angles of movement um, as in their function as angular accelerometers. Uh, the macula of the utric of the saccule is perfectly vertical and is connected to the cochlear duct by the ductus reunions. The innervation of the otolith organs is with the superior vestibular nerve to the macula of the utricle. Uh, and the superior vestibular nerve also innervates the crista of the lateral canal and the anterior canal. The, and uh, the inferior vestibular nerve is smaller in size. It serves only one and two thirds of the organs, uh, the macula of the saccule and the crista of the posterior ampulla. When we think about the otolith, uh, otoliths and otolithic membrane, uh, we have a very simplistic view of it. And indeed, there isn't a lot known. We have a lot of knowledge, but we don't know exactly how well this knowledge from the laboratory translates to human pathophysiology. We know that otoliths are formed uh, from the supporting cells of the uh, otolithic membrane that they are embedded in gelatin, that uh, there is free calcium in, some, in the, otol, in the uh, endolymph, and that that calcium is sequestered by dark cells uh, present in the vestibular system. We know that dark cells have a capability of active absorption through pinocytosis and dissolution of uh, shed otoliths, but we're not really sure how much uh, new otolithic material is produced in humans uh, over time. We know that if we interfere with calcium absorption, 
that large otoliths can occur. Now, it, contrary to most concepts of the otoliths, uh, otoliths are not all made of calcium carbonate. That only uh, about 60% of the mass of the otolith is calcium carbonate. The remaining 40% is actually protein matrix. And this um, uh, protein is important because when, uh, when calcium dissolves, the um, proteins remain in the endolymph for some time and may change viscosity and uh, some of the modeling of BPPV that we depend on. There are proteins which are in the core. There are separate proteins which extend from the core to the surface. There are proteins which cover the surface of otoliths. And then there are proteins which bind one otolith to another in a complex net. Uh, we know that BPPV increases uh, in frequency with age, probably because of breakdown of some of these nets of protein. But we also know that it occurs as a secondary event in vestibular neuritis when the superior vestibular nerve is involved. There are cases of inferior vestibular neuritis which have no increase in post-neuritis BPPV. Of course, head trauma uh, is associated with loss of otoliths which can then lead to BPPV. Migraine is associated with a markedly increased incidence of BPPV. A migraineur has a 7.5 times higher probability of getting BPPV compared to a person without migraine. And patients with Meniere's disease, basically a very sick ear, which is malfunctioning badly, uh, has a much higher incidence of BPPV as well. And since most of them have migraine, it may be that migraine is the underlying cause there. So the population prevalence is very high, about 1.6% of the population each year, and probably 20% of all dizziness is caused by BPPV. Now, we do get confused about BPPV, and the reason we get confused about it is that we have a very general concept of the anatomy of the membranous labyrinth. We know about the semicircular canals, but there are some particulars about the morphology, uh, not of the semicircular canals, but of the membranous labyrinth in which otolith disease really occurs that are important to clinical interpretation of uh, pathology. Uh, also, the illustrations used in papers are also following very general rules because that's the level of understanding of the artists who are making the illustration. Uh, we've also uh, forgotten the link between vestibular physiology and eye movements that is very important for interpreting eye movements in BPPV patients. Uh, so BPPV actually requires exceptional 3D visualization skills, uh, but if we don't have the right idea to begin with, those skills are not uh, of much use to us. So in order to solve this problem, um, I worked uh, for some time on creating a model that would be useful to practitioners and researchers alike. And we segmented a human labyrinth with the help of the Temporal Bone Foundation, Rindy Northrup um, and, and colleagues in Boston. Uh, this uh, uh, segmentation at 100 microns was uh, digitized histologically and then scanned uh, digitally and reconstructed to create a labyrinth that could be used for study. It was then um, uh, smoothed out by some consulting animators and cloned and then positioned correctly uh, to a human skull um, according to normative positions established by a team at Johns Hopkins uh, that used CT scan to establish the uh, most accurate normative positions of the labyrinths that has been achieved to date. So uh, these uh, uh, show that the posterior canals are, we always think of them as 90 degrees from one another. They're really about 82 degrees from one another. The anterior canals are correspondingly wider from one another than 90 degrees. They average about 104 degrees from one another. Presumably this growth happened as the, um, as the brain grew in our skulls. And uh, the, and the lateral canal is, of course, oriented vertically 
in a forward direction. Uh, uh, the traditionally, we think about this as a 30 degree incline. The actual angle is about 25 degrees. And when we think about the lateral canals, it's also important to think about the uh, upward angulation from medial to lateral, not just from posterior to anterior. And the reason that this is so important is that the ampulated end of the anterior canal is higher than the non-ampulated end. And this leads to some self-emptying of the lateral canals, which explains why even though they are the most easily loaded canals for BPPV, it, that lateral canal lithiasis is much less common than posterior canal lithiasis. These uh, patients cure themselves. So um, I combined the, I combined the information from this viewer into a downloadable um, viewer so that the model is contained in, in an environment where we have a, um, a gravity field. And here we have a, an ability to rotate and change the position of otoliths, put them where we want, and you can see with gravity that the otolith assumes the most uh, dependent position. And this allows us to very accurately test hypotheses on movement, on possible maneuvers, and uh, will be uh, an aid for communication in the community of researchers who are uh, interested in BPPV. So we can cure this person virtually here and the otolith will return to the utricle. So this is downloadable for free uh, at bppviewer.com. Now, when we, uh, in order to have, get BPPV, we need to uh, load the otoliths into the labyrinth and to get from the utricle into the posterior canal, for example, we have to tilt uh, backwards and uh, the otoliths have to traverse the common cruise. So because there is a 40 degree posterior angulation of the common cruise, we have to lie down at least 50 degrees for the common cruise to become perfectly horizontal to the earth. But if we lie down farther than 50 degrees, then the otoliths can proceed into the posterior canal. And when we rise, then they become trapped. So um, the anterior canal is something that can also be loaded, but requires a more uh, specific um, positioning. So if the, ladder, if the common cruise is loaded and the patient rolls forward with the head angled down, the anterior um, cruise can be, the, the anterior canal can be loaded. Um, also, if the head is hung very far forward, then the anterior canal can be loaded on rising. So this happens. Um, uh, younger people hang their head all the time, especially doing yoga. Uh, some of these patients have uh, a habit of doing sit-ups over a ball. Uh, so we have some older people who have anterior canal lithiasis, but many younger individuals as well. So let's look at the loaded labyrinth. In the anterior canal, the otoliths end up on top of the ampulla. Uh, in the posterior canal, they end up about 30 degrees behind the crista and ampulla. And uh, in the lateral canal, there are two separate positions where otoliths end up. Uh, there is an anterior and there is a posterior inflection caused by the bent toroidal shape of the lateral semicircular duct. And otoliths can be trapped between the anterior inflection and the crista. And these patients have something called apogeotropic lateral canal lithiasis. But more commonly, the otoliths are in the intermediate segment between the anterior and posterior inflection. And these patients have geotropic lateral canal lithiasis. Undoubtedly, if you've looked into lateral canal lithiasis, you have found the confusion associated with the term apogeotropic because many people talking about the apogeotropic form don't distinguish between canal lithiasis and actual cupula lithiasis. 
cupulolithiasis is an important problem. Uh, otoliths can be um, become embedded in the cupola and making it gravity dependent. And uh, this is particularly common in the lateral canal. And, uh, but another problem that occurs is a light cupola. And we see just as in alcohol in which there one portion of the um, positional alcoholic uh, nystagmus in which the cupola is floating, we see in some patients that the cupola is floating and this can happen with any cupola. Uh, and this is generally associated with in patients with vestibular migraine when they are um, symptomatic at the time of presentation. So uh, there is, um, uh, in order to interpret the eye movements uh, associated with the uh, cupola, then we, we need to know the planes of the cristae. And those are, um, can be visualized here uh, uh, on a screenshot taken from the viewer. Uh, so we know, a lot, we know about the angulation of the crista plane for, for the posterior canal and the lateral canals, but the anterior canal uh, cupulolithiasis has been very poorly documented, and this is only here as a conjecture. So if we want to find a null point um, for posterior uh, cupulolithiasis, we will find that the nystagmus stops when the patient's head is tipped about 30 degrees forward. This brings the crista plane perfectly vertical. And if the nystagmus will be one direction when the patient's head is behind that crista plane and it, and it will reverse to the opposite direction when the head is tipped forward of that crista plane. For the lateral canals, uh, the left uh, lateral crista plane becomes vertical when the head is turned six to 10 degrees to the left and the right become, becomes vertical when the head is turned six to 10 degrees to the right. Overall, a canal lithiasis is far more common than cupula lithiasis. And in canal lithiasis, posterior canal lithiasis um, is, accounts for about 90% of all BPPV we see. The remainder is lateral canal lithiasis and really only um, um, uh, less than 5% and probably closer to one to 2% of patients have anterior canal lithiasis. And this is very difficult to interpret and there are other causes of um, downbeat nystagmus which confuse diagnosis. Uh, cupula lithiasis uh, is less common although lateral cupula lithiasis is only, sli uh, only slightly less common than lateral canal lithiasis. Posterior cupula lithiasis is seen um, and uh, very rarely as an upbeating nystagmus at rest. Uh, this is contrary to our uh, teaching that upbeat nystagmus is always central. Uh, if you find a patient with upbeating nystagmus, try those uh, uh, positionings with the head tipped 30 degrees forward, forward of that position and behind it and see if the nystagmus stops and then reverses around to that position. A lot of patients have a multiple canal disease. So if the ear is sick and shedding a lot of otoliths, there's no reason that otoliths can't get into more than one uh, semicircular duct and bilateral posterior disease is the most common that we see, but often uh, patients will have a posterior and the lateral canal uh, affected on the same side. So let's think about eye movements in the BPPV. Uh, and to think about this, we need to think about the uh, relationship of the canals. Uh, we have the anterior canal and the posterior canal, which occupy similar planes. So the left anterior and right posterior canals uh, are on a general plane and they function together as a pair. Uh, when you tip the head along this plane, the LARP plane, uh, you're stimulating one canal and inhibiting the crista on the other side. This confers a particular sensitivity to the system. The same way uh, that we have the two lateral canals joined together in which when turning the head to, the one, to one side, we stimulate one side and inhibit the other. Uh, so the two planes are the LARP plane and the RALP plane for the anterior and lateral uh, and posterior canals. 
So in order to keep, uh, uh, to understand I'm, I'm movements, we need to understand uh, Ewald's first law. Now, um, Ernst Ewald was a physiologist in Salzburg. He was the arch enemy of the pigeons in the town square. He was adept at uh, opening their labyrinth. He could draw a pipette out to the diameter of the, to the internal diameter of their semicircular canal. And then using a, a tiny mechanism, he could apply pressure to the cupola in both a positive and in a negative direction. And his, eye move, and his uh, observations demonstrated that eye movements are always in the plane of the semicircular canal being stimulated. He also um, noted that the direction of the endolymph flow determines the slow phase of the nystagmus. So if you push against the cupola, the eyes drift in that direction. And that corresponds, that's very useful for us in understanding BPPV because that also corresponds to the direction of otolith movement. When otoliths are falling, uh, it's pushing the cupola in the same direction. So the eyes drift in the same direction that the otoliths are falling and then there's a fast phase to um, reset. Now there is also uh, a polarization of the cristae which he made note of. He uh, noted that the posterior and anterior canals seem to work together and we're going to continue uh, to consider them together uh, because of their RALP and LARP pairing. And the lateral canals, of course, are paired, as mentioned. So this is always confusing when we try to think of the semicircular canal uh, ampullae for the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior canals. And remember which one is utriculo stimulatory in the, toward the utricle and which one is inhibitory uh, away from it. Well, all you really need to know is that the lateral canal uh, is stimulatory in the direction of the utricle and that the other ones are the reverse. So if you just remember that the lateral canal is uh, positive in the direction of the utricle, you'll be fine. And we'll see how important that is later. So let's look at Ewald's first law and think about eye movements associated with the lateral canal on the left labyrinth. So we're looking at the left labyrinth and uh, this is the lateral canal and we've taken the axis of this. So if this were a bicycle tire, we've taken the axle and we have put it right into the top of the eye and it's a little because of the tilt of the lateral canal. This is not in the North Pole, it is behind the North Pole and over to the side. And the uh, eye movements will be around that axis. Similarly, if we take the axis of the posterior canal on the left side and transpose it onto the eye, we can see that a downbeat nystagmus with a fast, fast upbeating and rotatory um, eye movement is, results. And that's what we recognize in posterior canal BPPV. And if we transpose the axis of the left anterior canal onto the globe, we see that the eye drifts up and then snaps back down and to the left, down and torsional to the left. And this tells us that it is a left anterior uh, canal of iasis. So let's look at posterior canal of iasis. Um, so what eye movements are expected? Well, we know if, even if you don't have infrared lenses to look at the eyes, you have the patient lie down and you have them look to the side and look at the side of the eye. The uh, blood vessels on the sclera serve as an excellent marker of uh, upbeating and torsional nystagmus. And that is right posterior canalithiasis. So we're gonna move on there and uh, we're gonna have to lubricate that chair which is squeaking so loudly. The, um, now let's um, use the Ewald's first law to dissect the eye movements in BPPV. So this is fairly advanced. We have the patient in the left hall pike position and we can see that the otoliths are gonna fall down and that the eye is going to drift down and then snap back up. And this is the uh, torsional and upbeating 
uh, nystagmus characteristic of posterior canalothiasis. Now, what if when the patient is doing this, you have them look to the left side? Now they're looking into the axis of rotation and all you see is the rotatory component. You don't see the upbeating component um, because they're looking right along the axis of the axle of this canal. So the, uh, if we have them in turn look to the right, then all we see is the upbeating component, a pure upbeat, because there, uh, and the rotational component disappears. So this is a way to confirm the identity of nystagmus in any particular canal. So it's helpful to record a difficult exam and then scrutinize it later. So let's uh, look at a patient who has this uh, uh, gaze separation. So head is to the right. And there's an upbeating and rotatory nystagmus. It's very strong. So let's look at anterior canalothiasis. How do we diagnose it? Well, we have to do a Hall Pike uh, maneuver with the head hanging at least 30 degrees for the otoliths and the anterior canal to start to move when they're in the most dependent position. We see a downbeat nystagmus um, that is uh, torsional uh, away from the earth. And it's, it generally beats toward the affected uh, labyrinth as we looked, as we saw earlier. So here's a patient who has right posterior canalothiasis, that is this arc, and then um, right anterior canalothiasis, that's down beating and to the right. So they happen in, fortunately, in sequence rather than simultaneously. And that's one of the problems in BPPV is patients who have multiple canal disease often their responses happen simultaneously and it becomes very difficult to interpret their eye movements. But let's take a look. So Hall Pike right position, head hanging, well below horizontal, open your eyes and there's the upbeating component and rotatory. And now she's gonna close her eyes and now there's a downbeating and to the right and that is right anterior canalothiasis. Now, let's think about lateral semicircular canal BPPV. So remember these uh, uh, canals are turned up like the wings of a 747 uh, from one another. And think about the plane of uh, nystagmus that is created for independent disease on the right and the left side as a result. Remember, we are, can have two separate sites of loading, one in the intermediate segment and the other in the anterior segment of the lateral canal. Patients who have disease in this proximal segment uh, self-empty. There are the patients who you can never detect in the clinic. If they get their disease one time on sitting up on the side of the bed in the morning, it goes away and you never get to see it in the clinic. So, Canalothiasis is transient. Canalothiasis responses in general are longer in the lateral canal than in the posterior canal. And this may be um, a reason that the patients we see are the ones who didn't empty um, easily, as easily, because there may be a difference in their endolymph viscosity. And um, uh, canalothiasis always causes a geotropic and rotatory, um, a, a geotropic horizontal nystagmus. They always, the eyes always beat toward the earth. And um, we, so when we uh, see this differential loading of the canal, we can see that the uh, cupola will be displaced in different directions depending on where that otolith begins. And that can result in the traditional uh, 
uh, geotropic nystagmus or in ageotropic nystagmus. So let's look at lateral canalithiasis. So we continue the spine roll test back and forth at least four times in order to decide which side is stronger. And this is very important. Uh, we cannot make the decision just on the first or second pass. Um, so uh, four times and then you finally decide which is the strongest response. And the direction of the stronger response is the affected side. And that's important because you have uh, to uh, determine which side is affected for your uh, treatment maneuver to be uh, effective. So that's, if we talk about cupula lithiasis, uh, in this case, the nystagmus beats away from the earth and there's a null point. Let's look at a, let's look at a case here uh, and we'll skip right over that. This is a case of horizontal cupula lithiasis. Uh, this young woman has been sleeping in this position with her head slightly to the right side to avoid spinning. Uh, she's sitting in that position now and has very little nystagmus. I'm going to have her turn her head all the way to the right side. Now, when she does that, she's getting a, she'll get a brisk nystag, horizontal nystagmus to the left. Time to this, and this does not fatigue. This continues um, uh, for as long as she maintains this position. And it is, even though she has her head turned to the right, the horizontal nystagmus is to the left. That is a hallmark of cupula lithiasis of the horizontal uh, cupula. Turn your head now to the left. As she does this, we'll see that the nystagmus will slow, stop and then reverse. It's stopping and now it's going to reverse and then the head left position she has right leading horizontal stagnant. So this is uh, and then when she goes back to the slight head right position which is the uh, null position for her then the nystagmus stops. So let's uh, think about the way we diagnose uh, BPPV. And uh, this is always done with, of course, the Dix Hallpike maneuver. Now, uh, it, early in the century, last century, there was a great concern that BPPV was a problem of cerebrovascular insufficiency caused by compromise of the vertebrobasilar blood supply when turning the head on the body. And uh, so this made a lot of clinicians very hesitant to deal with it in any way. But, uh, Dixon Hall Pike actually constructed this simple mechanism in which they could make, maintain head on body position, but raise the feet and still elicit the associated eye movements, proving that there was no vertebra basilar problem. 
uh, associated in BPPV. Now they uh, initially published that this the Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver needs to be done quickly, but it seems that that actually is not the case. So the traditional Dix-Hall-Pike maneuver, uh, the patient is sitting up with the head turned 45 degrees to one side. They are taken down below table level by 30 degrees. Eye movements are, are looked for. The patient is brought up to sitting and the head is turned 45 degrees in the other direction. And then they head, hang the head uh, below the table with the head turned to the right. And the eye movements are again observed. That is the traditional maneuver. And you can see that this is the essence of it. And you can see a otolith in the posterior canal uh, dropping to the lowest position. Now, this is the way we think about the, uh, it, it, that's what we think is happening in the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. But in fact, when we have both posterior canals affected, both sides will move when we hang the head 30 degrees. And these um, responses may have different time courses and intensities and significantly cancel one another, making things difficult to interpret. When we, if we had a patient who had six canals affected, all the otoliths in every canal would actually move. Uh, so uh, this can, be, cr can create a significant amount of confusion. It seems that uh, moving the patient only down to horizontal will uh, enable us to separate responses. So in this case, the posterior canal in the lowermost ear will move, but the posterior canal is parallel to the earth in the uppermost ear. So even though it is loaded, no movement is provoked. So this way, um, in it, because of this, we established, we, we created an expanded Dix Hall Pike maneuver, which is now published and which we use routinely in our clinic. And to do this, we drop the patient only to horizontal with the head to the left. And then we immediately turn the, after reading eye movements, we turn the head to the right. And this separately assesses the left and then the right posterior canals. Then, when we are ready to assess ant for anterior canal disease, then we bring the patient off of the table down into the head hanging position on the right and then uh, on the left, and then we bring the patient upright. This significantly facilitates our uh, diagnosis and treatment of patients, and um, we don't have to wait a long time uh, after sitting patients up before we uh, re-perform the Dix Hall Pike. Uh, procedure. So if we think about lateral canal disease, what we usually know is that there's some horizontal nystagmus present on a Dix Hall pike maneuver. Um, but we know that um, if it is uh, geotropic, then it's canal lithiasis. And if it's ageotropic, it's cupular lithiasis. Uh, cupular lithiasis is also a sustained response, whereas canal lithiasis is transient. It's difficult though to know which side, but if the patient has posterior canal lithiasis, it's most likely that the response is on the same side as the affected posterior canal. There are different ways to determine uh, which side is affected. And one is that absolute axis of the nystagmus um, because the canals are actually tilted differently to one another. Now this can be a little uh, complicated, especially if you don't have um, infrared lenses. So we're gonna drop that. Um, and, uh, but, but it is visible even in our previous example of lateral cupula lithiasis. But um, the intensity of the nystagmus on the supine roll test is what we generally use. And it's the side that is most, that has the strongest nystagmus that is the affected side. And this is a product, uh, this um, is a, an association that is established by Ewald's second law. And that is that nystagmus caused by an excitatory stimulus is always stronger than nystagmus caused by an inhibitory stimulus. Now, why is that? The reason is that if we have a polarized crista, it also has a resting firing rate. Um, the resting firing rate happens to be close to 170 beats per minute. 
it has a maximum firing rate of 500 and a minimum firing rate of zero. This means that stimulation can occur, this means that stimulation can occur in the positive direction with an up regulation of 330 beats per second, but inhibition can only go down by 170 beats per second to zero. So when we do the supine roll test, we are turning toward the affected ear and toward the cupula. Now we're going away from the cupula, away from the affected ear and back and forth. Now we're going toward the cupula. Now you see there's more, direct, more duration of fall on this side and this response may be stronger. This is one of the reasons that we need to keep on going for at least four turns uh, before we know that otoliths are moving maximally in both canals for, to make a valid comparison. And we're going to skip over this. We already saw the supine roll. Now, when there's cupula lithiasis, we want to um, orient the cupula vertically to find the null position um, about 10 degrees to the right for the right ampulla, 10 degrees to the left. And uh, actually, when you so imagine this is the left side and you tip away to the right, well, then the otoliths are going to fall toward the uh, stimulatory side and that causes the stronger response. So this is Ewald's second law um, uh, as well. But it turns out that finding out the side of cupula lithiasis doesn't really matter because we treat uh, it the same. We use head vibration of some sort or head shake and uh, brant darroff exercises afterward. So we've reviewed some anatomy and eye movements. We've reviewed Ewald's laws, which govern the production of eye movements from the corresponding anatomy. And we reviewed some diagnostic maneuvers and now we're going to go through treatment maneuvers for a variance of BPPV. So let's talk about a posterior canal lithiasis and we'll talk about brant darroff exercises, canal with repositioning, the liberatory maneuver, and uh, 360 degree rotation deserves at least a mention. Uh, brant darroff exercises were uh, first described uh, in 1980 as a treatment of BPPV as an inpatient, and these patients had a good response rate uh, just when uh, alternating between these positions. Um, so when we look at a left, an affected left posterior canal, uh, we can see that when we hang the head, we elicit approximately 100 degrees of movement around the axis of the canal. When we move to the opposite side, the posterior canal becomes nearly uh, parallel to the earth and no movement is elicited. And this is um, all that brant darroff exercises do. They don't reposition otoliths in posterior canal lithiasis. Um, so that does seem to be effective and it takes about three weeks to, um, uh, equal, uh, of brant darroff exercises to equal the effectiveness of canal lith repositioning which of course was described by the late uh, John Epley uh, and in 1992. Uh, he has been using it for more than a decade prior to this uh, publication date and presented his findings as an academy course. Um, he was clearly a pioneer well ahead of his time uh, and uh, this is the first maneuver that was described, although it was not the first in the literature. So the way we do this is uh, the canal with repositioning is using the corners of the room. So look at the corners of the screen. Position one is to the upper left corner, position two to the upper right corner, position three to the lower right corner, and then sitting up. So let's take a look at this. Um, you don't have to hang the head below horizontal, but it is an enhancement. And let's take a look. So here's our model and here is left posterior canal lithiasis. Head is to the left, head is to the right, head is to the lower corner and then upright. And there is the, uh, there are the otoliths back around in the utricle uh, where dark cells can dissolve them. So let's take a look again, lying down, head, nose to the left, nose to the upper right, nose to the lower right, and then upright why is the head forward? Because the common cruise is 
tipped backward. And this brings the common crus uh, vertical to empty the common crus more effectively. So we, of course, wait. How long do we wait? Do we wait 30 seconds? Do we wait a minute? Um, generally, every patient has a certain latency from the onset of the hull pike to the end of their response. And this is an indicative of the um, hydrodynamic drag associated with their particular otolith mass. And if it takes 40 seconds for their response to end, then you should wait at least 40 seconds in each position. If it's only 15 seconds, then you can wait about, about 15 seconds between each position. And you have to do it more than once. So we're head, here is uh, the, you have to repeat the Dix Hall Pike maneuver to verify success. But if there were otoliths not completely um, removed from the canal, then that repeat Dix Hall Pike will reposition them in the canal. So the patient has to be brought up from the Hall Pike position by CRP sequence. So you always have to have time to do this several times. It, in general, there is a high success rate with this, uh, but repetition is approximately 1.7 um, uh, uh, repetitions for cure. Now, the liberatory maneuver works and is very efficient and fast. Um, this was described by Alain Simon and uh, is, seems to work very well. It was conceived of at a time when it wasn't clear whether cupulolithiasis or canalithiasis was really the cause, but it seemed to address both uh, situations. So we will take a look here. Here's a left posterior canal affected. The patient is brought down and loaded. Wait for about a minute for everything to load. And then you quickly move to the other side or along that RALP or LARP plane, whichever one you're treating, and you can see the otoliths fall over the circumference rather than back. And then when the patient sits up with the head tipped forward, uh, the, the maneuver becomes complete. That is all there is with the lib there is to the liberatory maneuver. So the head has to be cocked well down below horizontal, and the before and after positions need to add up to at least 40 degrees uh, below horizontal for this to be effective. So, uh, of course, we have these uh, fabulous chairs to rotate patients uh, all the way uh, around in 360 degrees, and these uh, can also reposition otoliths. So here we go. Here is the posterior canalith coming down and around the circumference of the posterior canal. Now these chairs aren't perfect. This could result in loading of the anterior canal here if you were turning at the wrong speed. And in fact, it was discovered uh, that that happened and that you could rotate in it to cure the resulting anterior canalithiasis as well. So when we treat lateral, let's move on to lateral canalithiasis treatment. When we do this, we are generally doing a log roll away from the affected side. Um, so you don't have to worry about the uh, apogeotropic form because when you do the supine roll test enough times, the apogeotropic form converts to the geotropic form. And when it converts, then you, know, you can just simply do a log roll. You can actually sleep with the affected ear up for a week, and that's pretty effective at curing lateral canalithiasis. There's a shortcut log roll, um, and there is a 360 degree rotation for this as well, and there's a quick roll. And you can even use brant darf exercises if they're modified the right way, and these are on my YouTube channel. Now, when you study this, it can be uh, confusing because all of these uh, maneuvers have eponyms attached to them and um, the uh, uh, and this results in uh, uh, not knowing exactly which maneuver is is which but let's go through them uh, the log roll is really the, the gold standard for this as the CRP is for posterior canalithiasis so um, we know that the log roll has a 69% effectiveness, the shortcut log roll about 61% effect effectiveness. So let's 
left posterior, left lateral canalithiasis turning to the left, and this is the wrong direction. And now the patient has anterior segment lateral canalithiasis. The otoliths are piled onto the crista. The patient feels sick now and will not come back for another treatment. They're now vomiting in your examination room. So we have to remember to turn away from the affected side. So this is the left lateral canal. Again, let's see, I thought we had advanced our slide. Here's another video. And now we have left lateral canalithiasis turning to the right away from the affected side. And you can see the progress of the otolith mass toward the non-ampulated end of the lateral canal and the entry of the, of the otolith mass into the utricle where they will not cause symptoms. So uh, sometimes a patient will have symptoms after repositioning because otoliths can be asymmetrically placed onto the utricle, unweighting it, causing a certain amount of ataxia. Uh, but this generally clears within the first 24 hours. So we're going to, um, you can sleep with the affected side up. The, the, this uh, Guffoni maneuver or Yakovino maneuver is very, uh, is the most efficient way to treat this. And this is the way I like to do it because large patients can't do a log roll, but they can do this. It doesn't get very much easier than that, and that's 61% effective. So if you do this in the clinic, and then you send the patient home with the modified brant darroff exercises, modified to maximize movement of any residual otoliths in the lateral canal, you should have pretty good clinical success. So this is the lateral canal, uppermost, head, turning the head toward the nose to empty the canal and then you sit up. So, um, and these are the modified brant darroff exercises. The patient just keeps the head forward rather than uh, turning it 45 degrees up. If you turn the head 45 degrees up on each side, then the lateral canal lists only move about 45 degrees. But by keeping it forward, we increase the overall movement by a great deal. And uh, in fact, uh, we've refined this now about 10 to 15 degrees upward uh, tilt, um, say it maximizes treatment and safety in this maneuver. So uh, there is also a um, supine head turning. You can just have the patient have the do the supine roll test. And that is the same as doing these modified brant darroff exercises. For anterior canalithiasis, there are lots of different treatments, but we're gonna to try to keep it uh, simple. There is the standard Epley maneuver, and there is the rapid um, uh, uh, midline maneuver called the Yakovino maneuver. And this is very, very effective. So let's just take a look. The standard Epley maneuver for on the, you even start with the head tip to the affected side results in movement of the otoliths. You do want to hang the head deeply. Uh, this in position two, uh, the otolith mass progresses even farther. In position three, the otoliths don't move at all because the anterior canal is parallel to the earth, but the otolith mass has progressed far enough toward the common cruise that when the patient sits up, the otoliths will fall from the third position in through the common cruise and into the utricle. And that's quite easy. Now we've shortened this and uh, by eliminating um, the um, unnecessary position uh, that can result in in effect if the head is tilted wrong uh, into a very simple uh, short CRP. And this is recently published. Uh, but the best way to do this be, uh, is to just have the patient hang their head severely over the end of the bed in the midline. 
This eliminates the need to know which side is affected. And when the patient rises, they will fall back out of the labyrinth. Usually there's an intermediate stop uh, about 45 degrees or 30 degrees up from horizontal. And of course you can do 360 degree rotation. Now you can also do deep brant daroff exercises for this and we send patients home with that. And the difference uh, that we see with what we do for the deep brant daroff exercises is that when the patient goes down, we really hang the head deeply onto the bed. Uh, and uh, not everybody can do it because they don't have the neck mobility. But this can result in actual emptying. It can be not only, it can be actually a therapeutic maneuver and is similar to a lateral positioning maneuver described by Reiko in the past for uh, anterior canalithiasis, but which is little known about or used. So we have um, a lot of different uh, options for treatment. Um, there's cupula lithiasis and we, um, there are special repositioning maneuvers which require a vibration and study. But in general, what you want to do is to shake the head or vibrate the head to detach otoliths. And when those otoliths do um, uh, become detached because of shaking or vibration in the plane of the canal, then you can do brant daroff exercises to move the newly shed otoliths away from the affected cupola. So the, mo the most difficult um, patients have multi-canal or persistent recurrent disease. They may need, may need um, maintenance exercises. Some patients are, are symptom avoiders so that they never provoke their symptoms and they're very strong and they won't do home exercises. Um, uh, cupula lithiasis can be very stubborn and some elderly and immobile patients are hard to treat in the clinic and even for the physical therapists um, who have um, extra tables and devices to help reposition. Uh, kyphosis is a real problem. But, but the need for surgery, which has been talked about in the past, is quite rare. Of course, um, otolith disease isn't the only reason for positional nystagmus. There's my, some patients with uh, vestibular migraine have positional vertigo. Blood products in the endolymph have been demonstrated. Patients have orthostasis and vestibular hypofunction resulting in intolerance of position changes, intoxication, and other rare problems. Let's just take a simple look at one model for posterior canalithiasis that is accessible to all of us, and that is our own oracle. So if we imagine that this is the ampulla and that this is the long arm of the semicircular duct and this is the common cruise and this is the utricle, uh, every patient we meet has a pretty good model of the posterior semicircular canal. If their ears stick out a little bit more than normal, then their model is more perfect. And you can reassure them of that. So here, let's, take, uh, let's treat this patient who has left posterior canalithiasis. So when we put them down into the hall pike position, the otoliths move to the de more dependent position. In position two of the canal with repositioning procedure, um, they move a little farther toward the common cruise. In position three, the otoliths move closer to the common cruise and on rising, the otoliths will fall down the common cruise because it's positioned at the top of the common cruise and fall into the utricle where symptoms will be complete. So that is the end. And I thank you very much for your attention. This kind of work doesn't happen alone. I've had the assistance of many fellows, uh, Rindy Northrup at the Temporal Bone Foundation, with, who helped me to create the model, and Brian Little at uh, Christiana Care, and the numerous uh, computer engineering and computer science students at the Delaware Biotechnology Institute at the um, University of Delaware. So I do thank you very much and I um, uh, look forward to seeing you again next year. Bye-bye.